Chapter 4, Revenue is a Lagging Indicator. When we set our goals for ourselves and our company, usually one of the first goals, and the most easily quantifiable, is a revenue target. But as important as revenue is to achieve, it's not the area on which we should focus. Revenue is the result of the work we put into our business every single day. That makes revenue the lagging indicator of the other tasks we need to measure in our business. When we reverse engineer the revenue goal to break down the tasks we need to perform in order to achieve the revenue goal, we end up calculating the number of prospects, the number of meetings, and the number of proposals which need to be accomplished on a monthly or weekly basis. Personally, I love breaking all this down to a weekly goal. A week is easy to manage. It's also helpful to be sitting at your computer on a Friday and know if you have enough meetings, proposals, and dedicated time for prospecting booked in the week ahead to hit your goals. And if there isn't, now's the time to get cracking. How many calls, meetings, and proposals do you need every week? Take the revenue you want to make in a year, annual revenue, divide it by the average client value, and you'll get the number of clients you need for that year. Divide this further by 52 weeks to get a weekly target number of clients. Less if you like to take vacations. Personally, I use 44 because I like to have eight weeks of vacation a year. Annual revenue divided by average client value is equal to number of clients per year. Number of clients divided by 50 work weeks per year equals number of clients per week. This is the starting point. Usually, if you're absolutely amazing in your sales and are able to create a client out of every person with whom you interact, and if you are, please do contact me because I want to know your secret to success. This is just the beginning of the formula. The next step is to figure out how many people with whom you need to interact to get the right number of clients. This is called the closing ratio. Closing ratios are one of those funny calculations because it can mean different things to different companies. Some companies will calculate their close ratio based on prospects who are at a certain point in the sales cycle. Often this is based on those who make it to lead qualification. Some companies and individuals go deeper in their calculations by measuring when they met their most recent close and how many people they spoke to in order to get to that close. But this could require keeping months of detailed data. Each industry and primary sales methodology may have a different close ratio. For instance, a person who walks into a Starbucks is more than 90% likely to become a customer. If you're trying to create an entirely online business, you will have closer to a 2% close ratio for the number of people who visit your website to who actually convert into a paying client. But if you're determining your close ratio for the very first time, instead of overcomplicating the process, it's a good idea just to get started and then adjust from there. If you know your closing ratio, great. Skip this next section. If you need to calculate it for the first time or recalculate it as your goals change and average client value increases, I prefer using the simple method. It may not be completely accurate, but it's a good starting point. And if you start selling and seeing how your actual numbers of meetings and average client deal sizes affect your goal results, make slight adjustments. Remember, you are measuring the tasks to get you to the goal. Now let's determine the total number of prospects with whom you need to be engaged weekly. Calculating the number of weekly activities. Sales 101 tells us for every 10 prospects we meet, one will agree to a meeting and eventually become our client. We don't rely on every person we meet to become a client. That puts too much pressure on the relationship. Timing, budget, people, and needs can all change at various times throughout the sales process. Let's instead make sure we have more meetings booked with prospects that are needed in order to make our revenue target. I recommend having four times as many meetings booked as the number of sales needed. That means instead of relying on every meeting to lead to a close, have four times as many meetings. And to ensure you really hit your revenue targets, aim for two proposals for every one you need closed. Number of sales needed over number of proposals proposals is equal to new sales times two. Number of meetings is four meetings until proposal. Number of prospects is equal to the 10 times the number of sales. Because revenue is a lagging indicator of the work done, the only thing we need to measure and have complete control over is how many people with whom we are connected on a weekly basis. By measuring our meetings booked, we will learn how effective we are in securing meetings with prospects. And measuring the number of proposals will show us how effective we are in having high converting sales conversations. 
The revenue will come if we're doing everything else correctly. If we connect with the right number of people, get the right number of meetings, put out the right number of proposals, and we still aren't getting to the revenue, that means we either need to increase our numbers. At the end of the day, sales is just a numbers game or become more effective and powerful in our interactions with our prospects. Fill out your sales funnel and send me an email. I want to hear from you. Are the number of meetings and prospects with whom you need to connect with something you can do? What do you need help with to achieve your goals faster? If you're listening to this on the audio version, feel free to connect with us on our website or at my email address and we'll be happy to send you a sales funnel template. Garth and his call tenacity. When I worked for Xerox, one of the best salespeople was a man named Garth. Garth was a socially awkward character. He had a hard time keeping up a steady conversation. His brain was always four steps ahead of everyone else's. He would come into the office with a wrinkled shirt all the time. And when we jokingly asked if he owned or even knew how to use an iron, he would reply he didn't need to. He took his shirt to the bathroom with him when he showered and the steam took out most of the wrinkles. I thought to myself that if his shirt only had the minor wrinkles I saw, what was the crumpled mess his shirt had started out like? But despite Garth's lack of presentation and his lack of being able to contribute to a standard conversation, he was also one of the best reps Xerox had at the time. Garth was a great listener. He would ask meaningful questions and he would always do the work. Garth was relentless when it came to booking meetings. When he would call someone to ask for a meeting and they would say no, he would check mark a piece of paper in front of him. And if you were passing by and you would hear him enthusiastically say to himself, nine more to go, and then eight more to go, and so on. When I asked him why he was so excited when he was rejected, he told me none of the responses were rejections. They were all just people telling him, not right now, and he would never lose a beat. In sales, we told each other for every person who answers no, they're actually saying, not right now. The timing isn't right. And timing is everything when it comes to sales. We depend on budgets, on approvals, on current projects to be completed, for resources to be available, or for vacation time to start or end. There are hundreds of factors we may need in order to move or start a sales cycle. But for those who understand the timing was off in the single moment you called that one time, we'll continue to call and we'll always get the sale in the end. But Garth would instead count down the number of calls he needed to make a meeting. Instead of counting the number of no's he was receiving, which could become deflating after a while, he counted down to the yes. Now, it's not a perfect science. You're not going to get through 10 no's and then magically the next one will be a yes. But it does mean it may take you that long to get to the yes. So hang in there. I borrowed Garth's method of counting down to the yes, and I was surprised how much more upbeat I was after the sixth or seventh rejection. When I was counting the number of refusals for a meeting, I felt like I was slowly chipping away, little by little. Changing the game in my head was empowering, because every now and then I wouldn't have to wait until call number nine before the next one became an agreement to meet. Sometimes it would happen on call six or four. Then I would celebrate. Yes, I got to the goal without having to go the entire way. And then I would start all over again. Focus on the goal. At American Express, it became harder to book meetings. I was no longer selling $40,000 printers. I was now selling $40 million payment solutions. I was asking people to change the way they were processing their payments, which is a lot harder to do. The people I called on were the chief financial officers, CFOs, for major international conglomerates. Or if I couldn't get through to them, I called on their vice president of finance, Oftentimes, I'd have to call 10 people inside one company hoping to get the meeting. At times, this required some fancy wordplay because when I did get in touch with someone at one of these companies and they tried to refer me to someone else who'd already said no, I worked to convince them why they were still the person with whom I needed to meet. Why would I do that? Because if I met with just one person in their organization, I'd ask that person more questions about their company and get to know their processes, systems, and the things they were striving for as an organization. None of this information could be found on a website. The more insight I had into the company, the more I could structure new conversations about how our service would impact their company on a larger, more positive level. But I needed to get the meeting first. So with the many times that I would call inside one company, it was common to go through many more calls which ended in, not right now, thanks, but I would persevere. 
After a particularly bad month, I finally shook it all off. I said to myself, you are going to keep calling people until you make your meeting targets. It was a Friday afternoon. And with all the excuses salespeople and entrepreneurs tell ourselves, one of the most common ones is, don't call on a Friday. No one wants to receive a call to book a meeting. This one is complete garbage. One of my best days for making successful phone calls were Fridays before a long weekend. Most people had already left the office for the weekend, and the only person left, including the one to answer the phones, were the higher-ups, the decision-makers. So I called. And I called more. I was on my 15th rejection, and I kept telling myself to dig a bit deeper. Call another one. The next one had to be yes. Finally, after 16 calls, I connected with someone who said, sounds good. Looking forward to meeting. I was elated. All that work had paid off. But what did I do next? I didn't stop because now I was on call 17. And if sales 101 is an accurate guideline, I would only have to make three more calls to get to my next yes. I didn't have to make three more. The next person I called also said yes. I was now officially done for the day. If you manage the tasks you need to do on a weekly basis, making phone calls, booking meetings, and sending proposals, the revenue will always come. Never take your foot off the prospecting accelerator. You may have a couple of great months. The money is coming in consistently. Clients are finding you through amazing methods and so you start to slow down. Prospecting is a lot of work and since the revenue is here, why spend all that energy prospecting more? Consistent prospecting will be something you notice the results of, maybe not right away or even 60 days from today, but you will notice it. In 90 days, when there isn't any revenue coming through, it will be because of the lack of action three months ago, not because of what you're doing today. As you grow your business and decide to hire new employees, this will also be something to watch for. Many people believe bringing on even slightly experienced salespeople is the answer to all their worries about revenue generation. But what are the metrics and targets on which you will be measuring them? What if revenue isn't enough? They must also ensure they hit their targets for calls made and meetings booked. And if you're reading this book, thinking you just want to know what to do and don't want to take action as part of the revenue generation team, you're sadly missing the point. I've met with plenty of entrepreneurs and business owners. They're wonderfully passionate people. They love their business and what they want to achieve, but for some reason, there are some who just don't want to be the leading salesperson in their company. I'll hire someone else to do that. Now, I've been through my fair share of cyclical economies. I know that there are great times. Bullish markets and spending is happening freely. There are also down times. The bearish market, recessions, and depressions. I have seen companies grow from 1 to 10, 15, and 100 people in a short period of time. I have also seen those same companies lose half their staff because of the loss of revenue. You may be fortunate to have hired others to help you become responsible for revenue generation, but the only one who's accountable for the revenue coming in is you, the business owner. Set a good example. Tell your team what you expect of them. Help them develop great habits because it's worked for you. And even when your team becomes so large that you are doing less of the revenue generation, it doesn't mean you should do none. When I worked for companies such as Xerox and American Express, even the president and vice presidents of those organizations had their own sales targets to achieve and clients to manage. Revenue generation should be everybody's responsibility. Now we're starting to see that shift to more companies becoming first and foremost sales companies. Companies are empowering their staff to have more client relationships. I've seen manufacturers train their delivery personnel to know how to question their clients more effectively. Delivery people are seen as reliable and the people with whom they deliver have great relationships with them. When a delivery person asks a question, you're almost always receiving honest answers. Imagine how powerful it would be if a delivery person was asking the right questions and relayed back to your sales team if there was a new opportunity to sell one of your new products or services. Xerox used to train their service technicians in the same way, and as a sales rep for the company, some of the biggest leads I received were from the people who were directly working with the clients in different ways. When I spoke to the founders of Barefoot Wineries, they said they trained the receptionists through the warehouse people and were amazed with some of the revenue-generating suggestions that came from these empowered employees. Sales skills 
and helping to generate leads should be the responsibility of every person who has an interaction with the client, not just the salesperson. Money is a flow through. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, those entrepreneurs who prefer to keep their ventures as single person operations. In the first conversation, I ask the person, what's your goal for the end of the year? And they will usually start off with something vague, such as, I want to make more customers. I want to feel like my company is a success. The struggle with these vague goals is how do you measure them and how do you know when you've achieved them? One time, I had someone tell me that they only wanted to make more money. I went into my purse and pulled out a $20 bill. I put it on the table and told them I was happy to provide and that I would be charging my normal coaching rate of thousands of dollars. The person choked. I had a good laugh. The point had been made. I helped them make more money. But without clarification and quantification on what that actually means, how do you know when you've achieved your goal? You can have many specific goals, but please ensure you also have a well-defined financial goal. It doesn't matter if you are a business owner or a salesperson working for a company. You need to define your financial goal because this is one of the areas which both measures the success and the tasks that need to be done in order to achieve that goal. Revenue gives us the ability to reverse engineer the goal to determine how we are going to get there. For instance, saying you want more customers as a goal? How many more customers do you want? How much do you want each customer to spend? How will you ensure your current customers aren't reducing their spend while bringing on the new ones? And the questions go on. When we choose revenue to be our target, we use our average value of each customer and we determine how many customers in total with whom we need to be working with. From there, we can use Sales 101 standard metrics of 10 prospects per customer to determine the number of prospects with whom we need to be engaging with a monthly or weekly basis. Usually at this point, someone will tell me they aren't motivated by money. And I get it. If you currently have a bad relationship with money, with limiting beliefs and self-talk such as money is the root of all evil, or if you had a parent who was always chasing the dollar and didn't appreciate the people around them, this could be a hard thing to set your target on. But you're right. It's not about the money. It's about what the money can do for you. Money is a flow through to greater opportunities in life. With money, we can tell the marketplace how to value us, unfortunate but true. People don't value the things that they get for free, but they do value the things and experiences for which they have to pay. The other reality is money makes the world go round. So when we determine our full worth, people understand it and are willing to invest in it. And we have the means to help even more people. It takes money to bring on a marketing campaign that allows more people to understand our message and impact. It takes money to hire more people so we can impact a larger chunk of the industry or the world. It takes money to publish books, travel to new geographies, and do the things that many industry leaders are doing. If we're not motivated by money, then it's time to become motivated. Because when money is coming in, we get to help more people. We get to impact a larger part of the world. I know when my company is successful, I have more students enrolling in our program. We have more attendees at our networking events. I get to hire more staff and provide them with a life, a career, and a way of positively affecting more business owners. We have the opportunity to invest in better events and share our message with even more people who are looking for a better way to connect with their customers. The students who do invest with us learn the processes and strategies to navigate a high value sale. This allows them to receive more revenue, hire people, invest more in their products or services, and help more of their customers do amazing work better. The single dollar that comes into our organization is not just the one dollar bill. It has the ability to multiply. And as it flows through us, its impact on everyone who it affects provides us true impact on the world. Yes, money may not be the goal, but it is something we can measure. It's not about making the money. It's about how it flows through to you to help others. How does the money a client invests in you, your company, and your service flow through you? Do you hire a marketing company? Ultimately help the owner of that company live a better life for their family? Do you hire employees who now have a career they love and a financial well-being that they can provide for their family? Or perhaps the profits or commissions you make from the sale ultimately allow you to take your family on the vacation of your dreams. Chapter 5. The Evolving 
sales cycle. Many people have a negative impression of what sales is because they're still caught up in the idea that sales is a greasy, pushy ploy to get someone to buy what they have. And if sales is about manipulation and coercion, to force someone to buy something that doesn't work and yet promises to be everything, this is the snake oil sales process. Selling a product that no one wanted or needed, and yet somehow people bought because of all the false promises it made. A man stood on the wooden soapbox at a fair, plugging his cure-all potion. This played out later with the impression we have of our discount used car salesperson, who said whatever he had to in order to get you to buy that lemon. It was the, I have it, and you need it. And that person would inflate the price to whatever the market would bear. There is little to this type of sale. The prospect knows they have a problem, and before the days of internet and easily accessible research, there was little the prospect could do to find the solution to their problem on their own. They could go to the library and read up on any topic they desired, but many chose to skip that step and go directly to the seller, trusting that person to be honest. They'd hear the information firsthand and then make a decision from there, oftentimes making their decision quicker than they felt comfortable with because the salesperson used a pressure technique such as this is our last one or there's another buyer coming within the hour. This type of sales process still does exist, but those who use it will not be in business for very long because with the power of social media and online reviews, people will not stand for it. We are protective of others and we want to ensure any person in which we are doing business is ethical and reputable in their delivery of their promises. The Challenger Model as technology took over and internet forums became available, buyers met in online communities to read the experiences of others. It was not enough for the salesperson just to push their product to the buyer. The buyer needed to be convinced before connecting with the seller that they were interested in potentially purchasing. Oftentimes, unless the client knew they had a problem, there was nothing for which to search. The challenger model fixed this by focusing on the problem the client might potentially be facing. In simplistic terms, the salesperson approached the client and started the conversation with, do you suffer from? The client, now in agreement, became more receptive to hear what the salesperson wanted to offer as a solution to the problem they'd only recently discovered was a problem. The challenger model focused on the problems the client had. It focused on the consequences of these problems and in a way became the new method for salespeople who wanted to set themselves apart as the new trusted advisor gain trust first in the pain, and then provide a solution to that problem. The salesperson became well-versed in asking, do you suffer? What is your challenge? What pain keeps you up at night? And so on. The intention being that as long as the salesperson focused on the pain and suffering of the client, there was always something to fix. That pain was conveniently fixed by purchasing the seller's product or service. Unfortunately, as information became more prevalent, the challenger model did not age well. Buyers no longer needed their salespeople to inform them of problems. They had the internet. If they had a problem, they could source the solution online. WebMD became the most recognizable solution provider in this space, and in effect, most websites mimic that level of information. The internet became a jungle of symptoms and diagnoses. When a patient went to WebMD's site, they filled out their symptoms, checking boxes and reading the little information pop-ups. When they were suffering from a certain symptom or not, occasionally hypochondria set in and the boxes were selected just to be safe. After seven minutes filling out an online survey, the patient got a printout of all the possible issues from which they could be suffering, the most serious at the top. Then the patient went to their doctor's office with a 15-page printed document and told the doctor that they already knew they needed to, and to prescribe them a specific pharmaceutical listed in the report. Today, our clients are no different. Unless we are approaching them for the first time and they have no idea they have a specific problem, they have already self-diagnosed themselves with the sources of their challenges and have searched out or sourced WikiHow to find the most appropriate Band-Aid fix. When we approach our clients for the first time with a problem-centric model, the answer we most typically get is that there is no problem. Because there really isn't. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it was a real problem, they would have already done something about it. The problem they are facing may be too big, but the solution they were able to source took too much time, cost too much money, or became too more involved than it was worth. The client likely decided the problem wasn't big enough to have solved. How do you help someone who doesn't have a problem? 
You can't. You can spend energy trying to convince someone of a problem they really don't have or that they have to completely change the conversation. Goal-based selling. In the new sales conversation, we move away from the client's problems and focus on their goals and aspirations. A conversation around the client's goals and aspirations becomes product and service independent. We question the client about where we want to be in their future. And although we may talk about five or 10 years in the future, many clients use these goals as a guideline as opposed to a specific plan. We are most interested in short-term goals, six months to a maximum of two years. Short-term goals are tangible. We can help someone get there easily. We provide feedback and advice and help direct a plan and help the client get to their goals faster. Goal-based selling is the epitome of working with someone on creating a relationship. Buyer and seller relationship aside, when we connect with someone in our lives, in our personal relationships, the reason we choose to date and eventually marry one person over another is because they match and align with our goals. Our dreams and ambitions match with what the other person desires, and we believe by working together, that person will help us get them there faster. When we start our sales conversation, we will surround our questions around the topic of where do you want to be in six months and what would this look like for you? Every client should have some goals for themselves or their business. If they don't, why are they here? As the client tells us our goals, our job is not to jump right in right away and help them, but rather understand the impact of not getting there. What would that mean for their business and why now achieving their goal is important to them? We cannot help anyone unless they are motivated to act. Only after we understand the ramifications of someone not achieving their goal can we then move to how our product or service will help them get there faster. Example of goal-based selling. I provide my calendar booking link in almost every email I send. I encourage anyone to book me and I am happy to provide phone call support in whatever the person is struggling with in getting more sales and ultimately achieving their goals. My next meeting is with a woman named Ashley. Ashley tells me how she's currently working as a day home operator, but no longer wants to do that. What she dreams about is starting another business, one where she's doing professional photography for businesses. She dreams of going into an office and taking corporate headshots and office environment shots, which will be used for websites and promotional material. How soon do you want that to become a reality? I ask her. As soon as possible, she replies. What would you like your business to be producing in six months? Dollars, clients, type of work? I dig further. I would love to be making my day home income in six months. Right now I'm bringing in 3,600 a month. I don't know how many clients that would be, but if I was charging $600 a client, I would need six per month, she replies. Her response is not uncommon for when I'm helping people undercover their dreams and turning it into an action plan for the first time. Ashley is dreaming but she's dreaming too small. She could easily charge more than $600 per client, especially if she's doing an entire company's headshots and other photography for promotional materials. But I don't jump into that topic just yet. Goal-based selling starts off entirely about the client and how they picture their dreams evolving. I don't want to provide her with too many new ideas until I fully understand the dream she's created. And what would being able to do only photography do for you and your family, I question. People dream of a better life, not just for themselves, but because of the impact it will have on others. Many of us dream about the impact on our families, whether that is to provide them with a better life, be home more, or give them experiences such as traveling that we always wanted for ourselves, and by default, our loved ones. Other people dream of the impact that they will have providing to the world, the legacy they would like to leave for others. I want to know how many more more people their dreams touch. What would it mean to affect that many people in ways one could imagine? It's easy to give up on a dream when the only person we may potentially disappoint is ourselves. If we try and fail, it's okay. Nobody needs to know. If we've committed to others and try, failure becomes less of an option and also harder to admit. I would be able to attend my children's field trips if I wasn't running the day home, she says. And I would be a a happier mother to my children. Now we're getting somewhere. And how would that make you feel, I ask. I hear the sound of her deep breath. Then life 
would be perfect, she slowly lets out. I am satisfied with that answer. No longer am I trying to help her move her income from full-time day home operator to full-time corporate photographer. I will actually impact her life in bigger ways. I am helping her be there more for her children. I am helping her create a perfect life in her head. That's so much more valuable than just replacing income from one source to another. Goal-based selling drives to the deepest levels of why we are helping the other person. What does it ultimately mean to the other person when we have this accomplished? Asking more questions during the goal discovery portion of the meeting, they will always be your guiding light. When the client becomes confused on eventually taking action to move forward in a deal, remind them that it's not just their goals, but the reasons and those impacts of those goals will have on their lives. The KO Advantage Sales Cycle. The sales cycle we've created and promote within our students is broken down into six simple steps. The first five steps cover the sales cycle to get to the first deal, with the sixth step covering what to do after the sale is made. After all, the best champions of your business are current and previous clients who are standing on the mountaintop singing your praises. Although the title of each stage of the sales cycle is based on what you need to focus on as the seller, below the title is the summary of where the buyer is on their own journey. Finally, there are a few tips on what, as the seller, you need to be clear before moving the sale to the next stage of the cycle. The seller and buyer relationship is no different than any other relationship you may be in. You may try to push your own agenda, but it won't matter. If the person feels they are being pushed into something they aren't ready for, they will leave. We will know where we are based on where the buyer is in their own decision-making process. Every relationship involves two parts. We cannot move forward until we are in agreement on where we are together and we're on the same page to achieve our goals faster. But before we cover each of the stages on what to do as the seller in the relationship, let's recognize how our sales cycle will align with the buyer's journey. We will use the buyer as a reference point to navigate us to ask the right questions in order to move us along the path together. In the PDF document below is the entire six step sales cycle process. Connect with us on our website for the detailed PDF, which you can actually download and print off for your own reference. Chapter 6. The Buyer's Journey Like all relationships, the buyer and seller have a two-part relationship. Far too many sales books and trainings focus on just one part of that two-part relationship, the seller. But a relationship book would never focus only on one person in that relationship. It takes two. Only by knowing where the buyer is in their own journey can we as sellers have a better idea of where we are. There will be times when we need to push the conversation along. There are plenty more times when we need to hold ourselves back and truly listen to the other party. What are they concerned about? What are they saying between the lines? The sales cycle and process must both include the seller and the buyer to know where anyone is within the relationship. If we only wanted to focus on what the seller does, how you act and how you make the other person take action, then you're referring to manipulation and coercion. That is not sales. Sales serves the other person. It does not force. Leading a sales cycle is taking the lead within a conversation. We become less like someone trying to pull a cat on a leash and more like a tour guide. If you've ever seen a cat being pulled on a leash, they often just lay down and become dead weight. If their owner thinks they're dead, maybe the leash will be taken off. On the other hand, a tour guide is much more inclusive in the conversation. If you ever hire a tour guide for a museum tour, they typically do a great job of touching on key points and helping you to move forward. They don't try to explain all the pieces in the museum or force you to get to the exit in the gift shop the fastest. They walk you through each room, asking you to take special attention to a couple of select pieces. You are welcome to explore more yourself knowing any questions can be taken back to the tour guide who will do their best to answer them for you. Then, when you're ready, the tour guide will lead you to the next room in the museum. It's not a rushed process. There is a timeline associated with it. Most museum tours won't go on endlessly, but there is direction. There is focus. 
And although as the museum patron, you feel as if you're in charge of the speed and the direction, the museum tour always knows that they're in charge. They just allow you the space to feel as if you have the opportunity to explore on your own. The buyer is on their own journey. Although we want them to feel as if they're in complete control, the moment they decide to engage you, it becomes the fine art between allowing them to explore on their own and leading them along. We need to respect the buyer while they are on their own journey. The buyer will go through many phases throughout their journey. In the very beginning, if we are approaching them for the first time, they may become aware there is a better way of doing what they've always been able to do. When the buyer reaches out to you as the vendor for the first time, they likely know they have a problem and there is a better way of doing things and they are seeking a solution. Then they collaborate with others to see who or what can solve their problem the fastest, cheapest, or easiest. Once they've determined a solution is out there, they will challenge the fit, purchase, and then experience the product or service. Below in the PDF is the entire six step buyer's journey. Connect with us on our website for the entire reference document that you can download yourself. Awareness. We all know about what we are knowledgeable about, whether that is because we studied in school, were taught it by our friends, family, or colleagues, or we took time to learn it, such as an education or hobby. Then there's a whole area of things about which we don't know what we don't know. For example, knowing another language exists, but not knowing how to speak it or read it, or knowing someone can study the discipline of aerodynamics and not know more than that when it comes to it. Finally, there is what is called the unconscious unconsciousness. This is the area of knowledge about which we know nothing and do not know it exists. These are the things which we learn for the very first time. This is the largest area of knowledge there is out there. There are far more things we don't know and know nothing about than what we do know. Many of our prospects will fall in this area before we ever have our first conversations with them. They don't know there is a better way of doing business, not because they haven't found the answer, but because they are completely unaware that the, the way they are doing business is not the best way of doing it. They are unconsciously unconscious. During our initial conversation with the client, we want to encourage creativity and start with where they are by asking, how could you do this better? When we ask questions such as, do you know there's a better way? The prospect may immediately become defensive. No one wants to be told they are not smart enough to know there's a better way. No one wants to be called ignorant in not knowing there was another possibility out there. Besides, if there was an easier way of doing what they were doing, they would have likely already sourced it and found it. Awareness is where we initiate the conversation. This will be your initial phone calls and introductory emails. This could be some form of inbound marketing, but those conversations often take a longer time to evolve. In sales, we typically initiate the conversations with the companies with which we want to do business. This isn't to say that we choose not to do business with companies or individuals who want to reach us, but rather when we start the conversation, we are more likely to educate the client first. We will provide them with the most accurate information, not information provided by inaccurate websites or competitors who are more interested in the financial transaction than the long-term client relationship. Seek a solution. As we grow our business, release more content, update the website, and move into educating our consumers, we will begin to have more prospective clients reach out to us. This could be from web searches which land on your website and submit a request through the Contact Us form, or it could be from referrals or word of mouth. But by the time the client reaches out to you for the first time, they have an awareness of what they need to grow their business, and it could potentially be provided by you and your company. This does not mean it is a done deal. Rather, this is just the beginning of a larger conversation. We must get to know from a prospect what they already know about us, the solution that they believe we can provide, and what the prospect believes will change in their lives, businesses, when we are done doing business with each other. But likely this consumer is seeking information from multiple vendors. Rarely does a prospect learn of the first company, even one with a glowing review, and not do more research on other vendors out there. They will begin to compare costs, time investments, 
comprehensiveness of solutions and reviews from others. Know where you stand and where you compete and own that with pride. Don't automatically assume the client is looking for something else. Don't tell yourself the prospect is looking for the best price. That's almost never the case. Your strength is knowing at what you excel and charging the right price for it. At KO Advantage Group, we do a lot of public speaking. We are hosted at various events throughout North America and speak on how to create premium relationships with clients. We may adjust the particular area of focus within the sales cycle and conversation, but it will always cover how to create valuable relationships which lead to higher paying clients and more personal attention. Jacob attended one of my events. He had been spending the last few months learning more about marketing and how to create interest in his website, ads, and other means of bringing new interest into his business. Then one of his friends mentioned to him that maybe what he really needs isn't more leads, but a method of closing those conversations. Maybe he should look into sales skills. Jacob was one of the first people to come up to me after my talk. He said he had started looking for sales strategies a week ago, and he felt like it was perfect timing when he saw my talk listed. I agreed to give him a call later that week and we would discuss more about what he was looking for. We had a great call. We talked about his business. We spoke about his goals and how having a sales process and strategy would help him get there there faster. Then I asked him the question to test where he is in his decision making process on the right sales education for him. What do you need to make your decision? He responded that since he was just in the beginning stages, he wanted to look more at my program and one other. I asked him what other program that might be. He provided me the name of another company. I knew of them. They offered a product a third of the price of ours. They used a completely different business model. Instead of having small classes meet in an online video chat with their instructor as we do, the other company required people to attend four hour sessions in person once a week. For me, this made no sense. If the person was having to give up a majority of their day to learn to sell, when would they actually have the time to do the selling? And most importantly, when we were willing to back up our claims, we provided a results guarantee clause in the contract. And as far as I knew, no one else in this space had a guarantee as in-depth as ours. We chatted about each one of those differences and why it was important as a business owner to choose the best solution for his company, not the cheapest or fastest, but rather the one that was going to support his sales strategy and growth as he built. Jacob wasn't anywhere close to making a decision, and if I was to push him to decide today, I would likely lose him as a client forever. He was trying to determine what would be best for his business, knowing he needs a solution today. Could he get by with cheap and fast training, which he knows isn't perfect, but maybe just enough to get him to the next phase? Or should he decide to go for the larger investment, financially and time-wise, and know he was getting the right solution? What I did was continue to talk to Jacob. We agreed I would call him in a couple weeks and continue our conversation. The best I could hope for with Jacob was to move from him to a collaboration phase. I continued to talk to him about his business and goals, product and service aside, and became the trusted advisor in the process. Collaborate. At the collaboration phase, the prospect starts to open up and become more honest, if honesty is one of their values about what they are seeking and how they believe it will impact their business. If the prospect is not honest with you at this point in the conversation, it is up to you to decide whether you want to continue the conversation and feed their ego, or if you are more interested in helping those who are better aligned with your values. In the collaboration phase, you should feel as if the client is opening up to you. The questions asked are being received with open and transparent answers, no matter how difficult the answers are to hear. And this is where the magic starts to happen. When we collaborate with the client, we are creating the best solution for that client together. We may already know what we're able and not able to do for them, but every client is unique and wants to feel their unique needs will still be addressed in the standard solutions being created for them. If you're completely customizing the solution for your client, you will need to understand from their perspective what may go wrong what they are most concerned about, and how the solution they are ultimately seeking will help them achieve their goals faster. The collaboration phase in the buyer's journey aligns with the value creation phase in the sales cycle. A majority of your sales cycles will be coinciding in this area. Challenge. As the sales cycle moves forward and the prospect becomes closer to making a decision, new questions from the buyer will arise. This is where the prospect begins to challenge the fit. Objections may include, 
How much will it cost? Can you do it for cheaper? How fast will it be completed? What happens if it doesn't work? What guarantees do you have in place? Who else have you worked with? And so on. This is a good sign. It means you are closer to getting the deal, but it's not done yet. This is an important process for the buyer. They are on the fence. They are close to deciding and want full confirmation that this is the right decision for them. Some people will need more assurance than others, but what they are ultimately asking is, will you be there for me when I need you? Objections are best answered with additional questions and understanding from where the concern from the client is stemming. I have seen deals lost because for every objection, the salesperson or business owner had a perfectly scripted response. With this type of response, you may end up moving the prospect from feeling you understand their unique needs to, I have an answer for everything. Scripted responses make your client feel as if you receive those objections all the time. They feel as if, I'm not the only one who's concerned about this, which may play in your favor or against it. When the prospect begins to challenge the fit, the best place to go back is to questions. What will make them feel comfortable to move forward? Why is that a concern for them? Where is this concern stemming from? Once you've addressed their concerns, move away from following the client's lead on where their comfort is to now giving them the slight nudge. It's time to ask for the deal. What will it take for you to say yes today? Buy. The buying process for the client includes the proposal stage, the signing of the contract, and the initial implementation. The prospect may be in buying stage with more than one vendor. This is because they still haven't made up their full decision yet and are hoping for some golden moment in one of the proposals where the best answer will be provided. If you are up against multiple vendors or even just one other party, understand how the buyer will be making their decision. Ask them, how will they know they made the right decision? By what will be they be judging the different solutions? How will they know the solution they picked worked? And how will it be measured on those results? Price aside, what else is important in that decision? How will those factors be ranked in importance? If a client answers me that they are most concerned about price and then other factors after that, I will try my best to push them back into collaboration phase. I know I'm not the cheapest solution and chances are you chose to read this book because you aren't either. Solution providers like us don't compete on price. We will always lose and I'm okay losing that battle. I will ask the client, why did you choose the vendors you did to compare us against? And if that doesn't get them to start changing their minds, I will press on. What's more important, the cheapest price up front or maximizing the return on your investment? And the return on investment should be clarified before this point in time. This will be covered further in the chapter determining return on investment. When you are at the proposal stage, the proposal is as much a part of the buying process as the signing contract. This is your client's first opportunity to see and feel what it'd be like to have you as a partner as they continue to grow their business. Once the client makes the decision to go with you, it becomes about stepping up and showing them the absolute best experience money can buy. Be there early, quickly, and often with the answers they seek. Do your best to step above and beyond because referrals don't typically come immediately after the client has bought, but rather after their experience of working with you and your product or service. Experience. This is the moment where your client has been working with you, experiencing your product or service and is now ready to stand on the mountaintop and sing your praises. The deal isn't done when the contract is signed. The deal is done after the service has been delivered and the client has agreed to provide you with a testimonial. That's the true reflection on whether you have done an exceptional job. As you continue to grow your business, spend more time and energy asking yourself, how can we create a better customer experience? How do we make the onboarding easier? How do we provide our clients with even more value for the price they are paying? How do we make it easy to increase the number, quality, or impact of the testimonials our clients are providing us? When you make the experience seamless, future sales cycles, marketing initiatives, and sourcing new clients, all of it becomes easier. And when you're ready to expand into new products or services, your current and former clients will be the first ones to whom you'll be able to go to to buy. They will be the ones most likely to buy and the ones who will give their honest feedback on how you can make it even better.